Welcome to In the Garden. Good day. My name is Heather Worley, and I am a Montgomery County Master Gardener, and today I'm going to serve as your moderator. Uh, Joining me today are the experts, uh, Melissa Siegel. She's also a fellow Montgomery County Master Gardener with the program, and we have Josh Demers, who will be presenting our program. He's the lead gardener at Montgomery County Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland, and He will be presenting shortly on the Japanese garden. Uh, Some of the services that Montgomery County Master Gardeners provide to um, citizens of the county include a speakers group. Uh, We speak to garden clubs and other community um, clubs um, about horticulture. Uh, We have two demonstration gardens. There's one in Durwood at the farm park um, up on the hill. And we also have one at the fair. And you will be seeing some master gardeners if you come to the fair this year in Gaithersburg. Um, We will have a booth there and master gardeners manning the demonstration garden there. We also offer youth gardening programs uh, as well as therapeutic horticulture and special events and Ask a Master Gardener uh, plant clinics, just to name a few. So, Melissa, I know you've been involved um, with Master Gardeners for a long time. What's your favorite program that you've been involved with? My favorite program is uh, Therapeutic Horticulture. I um, have been doing it since 2013 when I became a Master Gardener. We go into adult care homes, assisted living facilities, and do therapeutic horticulture, um, actually horticulture programs. We come in with an educational program about a plant or or some aspect of gardening, and then we do a project with the residents, and they just love it. And um, I think it's one of the best things we we offer. We have... um, therapeutic horticulture programs in 22 locations and we're always looking for others so if any of you are interested in um, helping start one of those at another at another facility we'd be glad to help you Uh, let's see I want to talk about one experience I had and you'll really understand what we do Um, we brought a program in it was um, called a kokodomo it was a, a Japanese flower arranging, plant arranging um, program. And it's, you make a ball with soil, fresh soil, and you cover it with moss and you make a hole in the top and put an orchid or some kind of plant that just likes to be sprayed, just needs the moisture. We um, helped them make these and then tie them up so they could hang them in their room, easily accessible to spray. And um, one woman picked up the soil and she said to me, I just love the scent of fresh soil. And it really made me think about these people. They don't have access to the outside and they don't have access to those things. So I feel like we're doing some really good work. And that's my favorite program. So you bring the outdoors in for them. Correct. Correct. And Josh, I heard you had a similar program or something for wellness that's at uh, Brookside Gardens as well. Yeah, so we here at Brookside, um, you know, we try and emphasize many things in addition to education, but also um, sort of well-being. Um, so we actually have a, a walk for well-being um, where, you know, we hope our visitors can can walk around. We have signs placed along the, the paths um, and just that kind of helps them as they stroll to sort of take a minute, you know, stand, listen to everything around, you know, feel the sun if it is if it's sunny uh, or the rain, if it's raining um, and really just be present in the moment. So it, it really goes hand in hand with what Melissa was saying. It's really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, so, you know, come check it out at Brickside. Great. But today you're going to be presenting about the Japanese garden. So you're going to give us some time to be mindful and to kind of take a virtual tour of the Japanese garden there today. Right. I sure hope so. And I hope I can entice some people to come out and, and, and take a look and, and we can talk horticulture. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and go ahead and get started. Okay. So as mentioned before, uh, my name is Josh Demers. I'm a lead gardener of the Viburnum, um, the Goody Garden, and actually more recently as well, the Berry Porter. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the Goody Garden, uh, which is actually Brookside's very own Japanese garden. Um, initially finished in around 73, 75. Um, we've been working 
since about 2016 on many, many renovations. Um, I've been working with a, a Japanese garden consultant um, based out of uh, Texas, um, but he actually trained in Japan. Um, so hopefully you'll find some of the uh, uh, information of uh, interest. Um, so again, uh, we, the Japanese or the Goody Japanese garden, um, it's, it's the stroll garden. Uh, there's three main types. Uh, it's a bigly stroll garden, also known as a pond, uh, hill and pond garden. Um, there's a dry garden and then there's also a tea garden. Ours, the Goody garden is, is more so the stroll garden. Um, and so what, what, uh, designates a stroll garden? Well, there's, there's many walking paths and that's again, meant for strolling. Um, the large size, um, it contains ver various features. Um, and that invokes a sense of mystery and desire to experience what lies ahead. That's one of the major um, goals of a Japanese garden is to sort of create an experience for the visitor. Um, and typically, as I mentioned, a stroll garden, also known as a hill and pond garden, the water feature tends to be the focal point. So you can see in the... Um, if you can see in the in, in the map here, um, so we actually have this is called the lower Goody Pond here. It's actually separated from the upper pond by these two dams um, that sort of um, intersect the the uh, Goody Island um, uh, area. So key elements of Japanese gardens. Um, so this is just sort of an overview. Um, so what we consider the bones of the garden are the stones. Um, you know, one of the things I found, you know, starting my sort of uh, journey in the Japanese gardening is, you know, gardening is not solely plant material. It also focuses on stone. It focuses on woodworking, um, even making your own tools. Um, so, you know, it's really a, it's, it's a variety of, of techniques and, and, and uh, jobs that you have to do. So the bones of the garden. Um, so we places emphasis on the utilization stone. So whether it's a signal uh, to, to signify entry um, to a location such as a tea house, um, it's used for walking paths, which would be uh, Tobi Ishi and then Nobodan. Um, and then we can also use them to bring tall elements in the scale or to even emulate mountains. Um, so one of the main uh, uh, principles that we use when we place stone is we always want the top of the stone to be parallel with the sky, and that's actually called tenba. Um, and surprisingly, up to three quarters of the stone can be set in the ground, and that's to give it more of a, of a sort of weathered appearance, where the soil around it eroded while the stone itself was was covered in soil at one point. Um, so typically, what we try and do, and what Japanese traditional Japanese gardens do, is they, is they try and utilize locally sourced materials. Um, so, for example, I'll talk about it, but we typically use Carter Rock, um, which is just down um, River River Road. Um, and then so, you know, we try and, again, focus on one to just a few types of stone. We don't want to get so many stones in, in the garden that it just becomes sort of a, 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 a distraction from, from the beauty of what we're trying to, to uh, create. Um, so, again, stone. So, we can see here, this was actually in 2017 we began the renovation of, of um, Reflection Terrace, which is actually a memorial, um, a place to reflect on, on the lives lost during the 2002 um, D.C., uh, Maryland, Virginia area snipers. Um, so we've actually stabilized this bank using, again, stone. Um, this is actually sawn um, Carter Rock, um, and they're actually uh, sort of, we call them bo uh, bollards, and those are just set vertically. Um, into the muck. Um, you can see we actually had to get a permit. Uh, we had to drain the pond down about a, a foot or two, we dug a trench and then inserted these. So again, going back to the fact that gardening is, Japanese gardening is not just solely plant material. It's also hardscapes. So um, are those stones buried three quarters down or not, they go down? Not so much. So we actually found, luckily we found that when this, when we were digging, there was a lot of really I will say good clay for holding stones. So we, you know, some of them could be buried halfway, um, but really we ended up going probably about a third of the way in. Um, you can see how some of these tall ones here um, were maybe, I want to say four feet, if I recall correctly. Yeah, on the pallet. So, you know, we put a significant portion, maybe a third or a quarter in. Um, and then we actually backfilled with, a, you can sort of see it here, this geotextile fabric 
and and uh, Bluestone. Um, and that's the sort of help, you know, create a solid base behind here so that we don't get so much push, um, pushing like soil up against here. Um, and again, if you come out to Brookside, I have a picture on the next slide, but you actually see it. They're still, still standing from 2017. So this is, this is really the finished product. Um, you can see from here, you know, the stone pebble beach that we have is not, is not put, it is not finished. It's not installed yet. Um, and then obviously this isn't planted. Um, but here you can see this is after planting. This is after the installation of, of the bollards. Um, you can see here, this is actually Delaware river stone. Um, set in mortar. Um, and that's actually also another Japanese technique of using stone in, in, in the uh, landscape. And again, that's to emulate sort of what you would see in Japan as a, as a beach. Um, so again, you can see the various stone, all this stone here, we, we, majority of it, we added some of it, we just reset, um, re-leveled, you know, to get that tenba. Um, and then once that was done, we, we planted. it. Um, so here's another, I uh, mentioned Nobodon and Toby Ishii. So Toby Ishii would be the bigger stones here that you see. So the bigger stepping stones, the Nobodon would be more of the sort of small granite cobbles that we have here. It's, it's, this design here is loosely based on that. Um, so you can see, we sort of infill the, the larger stones with the smaller stones. Um, also uh, talking about stone, I mean, we'll actually use it in the landscape as in, in, in some sort of features that we have. So this berm here that we created using recycled topsoil from within our own um, composting facility, we actually built this, sculpted it with our uh, heavy equipment and actually added in these large Carter rock boulders. Um, and again, we, we, we sawed it, we put sod, you know, tall fescue on it which seems very, very basic, but it gives us the intended effect of a rolling hillside or rolling mountain, a, a forested uh, mountain. Um, and then the stones jutting out sort of give that, again, weathered appearance, you know, the, the soils eroded around the stones, the stones have been there forever. Um, and this is actually at the Goody Garden cut through. So if you were to come from say where John or even Stephanie back here, they're walking on this cut through and you're actually met on the backside with this rolling hill covered, this is halfway through the, the the uh the sod layout but it's actually covered in turf and if you look in the distance from here out towards the garden this actually picks up on the rolling hills of the goody garden so again japanese gardens we try and bring you know the background into the foreground using smaller scale features um so the next the next thing we'll talk about is the flesh of the garden so we can consider that the plants so plants utilized in japan for centuries so think uh, species such as camellia or even Japanese maple, Acer palmatum. Um, we tend to focus on evergreens um, because they provide uh, green all year round. Um, but more specifically, evergreens that can be sheared or pruned in a particular form. So we talk about tamamono, which I'll explain, and then we talk about entoke. So two of the the more common sort of styles of pruning in the Japanese garden. Um, and then we get into a really refined sort of pruning of, of, of the pine. So that would actually uh, includes needle thinning um, and then masculine versus feminine forms of pine pruning. Um, I'll discuss that later. It's, it's, it gets a little detailed. Um, and then, so again, like I mentioned before, emphasis on evergreens, uh, with less emph emphasis on the deciduous, but by putting less emphasis on the deciduous material, we actually make that the specimen in, in the, the sort of planting. So when we use deciduous material, we typically focus on plants that have great fall color, or if we talk about cherries with a great flower. So on the left here, this is actually a new, relatively within the past couple of years, we've finished this planting. Um, we have this path that walks up again. This is reflection terrace. Um, this here, again, you can see the emphasis on, on all the evergreens. So, you know, uh, Pinus densiflora, uh, Camisipper subtusa. Really, the only deciduous material we have in this bed is this Japanese maple, Omuriyama, and then there's one down below. But that's really the only deciduous material we have. So, again, that lends this and the other maple to being the specimen in the winter. Um, so, and then on the right here, we can see that we have these Ilex cronata heleri. Um, planted with Jumers becomes Nana. So the Ilex Granata, again, it's a basic, it's a used widely plant, but it fulfills that need and, and 
in being able to shear it into that sort of temimono style. Um, and again, it's you can sort of see this is the the Prunus subtilla pendula. So this is actually in flower, obviously in the springtime. During the winter, this is you know drops its it's defoliated, drops its leaves, and then this sort of becomes the the sort of emphasizes this this sort of weeping you know skeleton of a tree. Um, so here we go. Um, this is actually taken from Suki Living Magazine. So if you are interested in in uh, Japanese gardening, it's a very 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 good resource. Um, so we can see here, this is Temimona. So again, low, um, broad shoulders that sheared into. Again, you can see why Ilex Granata is, is used this way. Um, and over here, is, this is at the Adachi Museum in Japan, like the premier Japanese uh, garden. Um, so again, if you look here, this is actually a stone. And these also sort of look like stones as well. So we can use the plants in a way that we sort of can make them the bones of the garden almost, even though they're still the green material, so the flesh of the garden. Uh, this is the um, entoke. So again, it's it's a it's a tall dome, um, and if you notice, you know we never cut inside. This is just a basic pruning. We never, you know, cut at an angle where the sides would be lower than the top, because again, what will happen? The bottom will die out. It'll become thin, and that's not what we're going for. Um, so again, entoke, this is great for a lot of the uh, hollies, like for example, Millie Stevens can be treated this way. Um, even Osmanthus, the false holly. Um, yeah, so you can cut that into entoke. And that's that's one of the ways that, or those are some of the plants that we use here in the garden. Um, so again, I mentioned pine pruning. So this year is actually uh, Pinus densiflora aria. And this is one of the older ones, specimens that we have out on the Goody Island. Um, we love these because you can see the red bark and actually a, a really cool sort of tip is if you have these, you can actually go in and flake off the old sort of gray bark and that'll actually expose this more reddish, um, nice flaking bark. Um, and it's really, really nice when it rains because it really brings out that sort of burgundy red color. Um, so what we do with, with pines, again, as I mentioned, is we remove the oldest needles, especially those hanging down. Why do we do that? Well, we want more of a layered appearance. So you can see, you can see the branching structure in here. Um, it's not so dense um, and we don't have just one big flush of growth and all over the plant. We want to be able to see the structure. Um, so for here, we actually, for a, like a Japanese red pine, we would consider this a feminine form of pruning. So what does that mean? Well, we leave three candles. So you have one, two, and then one that comes out from underneath. So as opposed to a pine such as Japanese black pine, Pinus dumbergii, you would actually remove this bottom uh, candle here and just leave these two. Um, and what does that do? That sort of creates a, a better branching structure. Um, and again, it, it, it creates more of a, of, a, of a personality in the plant, makes it look older. Um, because again, we're trying to emulate um, sort of an older landscape with something that, you know, we're, we've been maintaining um, you know, within recent years. Um, so yeah, this is actually one of my favorite trees out on the island here. Um, so again, we talk about the plants and the fall color. So a lot of the fall color you're going to get from the deciduous, or actually really all the fall color you're going to get from the deciduous material. So this picture sort of a, uh, is the epitome of, of the fall color that we're looking for. So Eastern Paul Maiden, this one is actually uh, blood good. Um, so you can see that really nice red um, color in there. We have sapium japonicum with this sort of yellow. Um, and then over here is actually one of my favorite trees, um, Acer pseudocibolinatum, um, which is Korean maple. Um, so you get those really, really nice fall colors, but you can see there's also a lot of evergreen. So we've got this, um, uh, uh, the dwarf white pine, pine strobus nana, excuse me, and then cunning hamia in the middle of the island. Um, and then we have some cami cypress. Um, and again, it sort of plays well against those sort of darker greens of, of the evergreens. Um, yeah, so in summation, uh, we're, we're manipulating the landscape to duplicate, duplicate natural settings. Um, so it's, that's why, you know, in, in Japanese gardens, it's, it's really time, you know, you work with time. Um, and so that's why a lot of the landscapes that we see, you know, that they're, they're heavily manipulated, but it makes them appear so much older than, than what they may be. Um, and 
If you have any questions, feel free to email me here um, or come visit us out in the garden. Um, always, always uh, appreciate talking horticulture and especially Japanese gardening. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. That was a great virtual trip um, through the Japanese garden at Brookside and very timely too with the Olympics going on in Tokyo. Exactly. Yeah. The coverage of um, the sports, they had some bonsai trees in the background over Tokyo mm-hmm. Day, um, some topiary. So yes, I guess you have to have a pair of good shears Yes. Order, yes. Garden, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And keep them sharp. Keep them sharp. Well, if you yep. have any questions for Joshua or um, any of general gardening questions um, regarding any of the programs that we've presented, um, we have on our website, which is um, a link that um, thank you to Bev Carriger. She is our producer today and she is um, posting links as we speak, um, which um, will lead you to submitting questions about the programs that we offer. When you do submit questions, Please uh, include your email so that we can contact you um, in case we need to follow up. And pictures are always important um, in helping us diagnose what the problem might be, um, because that could help us zero in on um, what, uh, how to answer your question appropriately. Um, you can also, if you've previously answered questions that we have um, put our heads together as master gardeners to answer for you from In the Garden on our YouTube announcements. So since our last program, we've actually received um, the following questions. So I will go through and, and read those and um, respond to those. I, I will be answering some, uh, Melissa will be answering some, and Josh will be addressing some of them as well. Um, so the first question pertains to squash. Um, so we got some vegetable um, questions. So one concern by many are squash problems that you could have in the garden. And they ask, is just planting around mid-June avoid the squash worms? How dry or wet does the ground need to be? What if any fertilizer to use? Why are you supposed to plant squash in mounds? And can you cage or trellis squash to keep it contained? Why do plants get blossoms without setting squash? And does planting marigolds nearby help pollination to prevent pests? So there's many, many questions um, involved with that, with squash. So I'm gonna try to address um, all of those in turn. So first, summer squash can be planted early um, if you want to lessen the injury due to pests with the use of transplants rather than using squash seeds. Seeds do better um, planted in mid-June because they need that warmth in order to germinate appropriately. Um, Planting transplants in early June increases um, the likelihood of getting ahead of that life cycle of the squash bug or the squash borer. And those are the two major pests, known pests of the squash plant family. Um, Recently planted transplants and sprouting seeds need regular watering, but um, not to be heavily soaked. Um, You always want to create a balance with uh, moisture uh, and not left to dry as well. So with Maryland weather, um, you know, some of the storms that we've had recently, you want to monitor um, the garden and your plants according to their moisture needs um, with uh, the weather. Once established, the watering can be decreased in frequency and all um, vegetable gardens um, with regards to the soil should have a t- soil test done about every three years, and that will help you identify what nutrients your soil might need um, or the pH level that would be appropriate for the plants um, in order for them to thrive um, and then fend off those um, pesky problems. Um, as far as the mounds that squash are planted in, um, you need three or four seeds per mound. And what the mounds do is increase pollination opportunities due to the location of the plants to being at the close proximity. 
And mounds also allow digging um, to add compost to the soil. And yes, you can trellis uh, squash plants. You can train them um, just like you would do uh, Japanese gardens with your shears. You would um, then um, have some sort of frame that would um, they would grow up and vine up. Uh, it allows smaller plots to be used for growing uh, squash. And squash with blossoms and, and not getting fruit may be due to um, rainy weather that discourages bee activity or the lack of um, pollination. Um, they have both male and female flowers and both must be present to ensure fruit develops. And then the marigold question, um, they do bloom all season and they attract bees. They, they also put off an aroma so they could be a pest deterrent um, from certain types of uh, vegetable plants. So they can help with um, increasing pollination um, as well as other um, flowers. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa because I know that you have um, made some yummy squash blossoms previously. And you are going to be talking about our second question, which has to do with what flowers you can put in your vegetable gardens, whether they're annual or perennial, um, that can deter pests, or which in help improve pollination, and then how you would interspace flowers and vegetables. Great. Hey. Thanks so much, and thanks, Peter, for the question. So many annual flowers have long been known to have beneficial qualities for vegetable plants. It's called companion planting and long used for vegetable gardens. I've also seen flower gardens um, with vegetables incorporated in, the, in them, such as lettuces, different colored lettuces to add um, mass, whatever. At um, I saw them at... Um, a couple of gardens in our area. And so they work both ways. The benefit could be more vigorous growth, higher yield, repelling pests, or attracting the predators of common pests. For starters, some are incredibly helpful in repelling pests. Others, with their attractive blooms and scents, aid in bringing in beneficial insects. Some annual flowers can even keep certain diseases in the garden at bay. Let's start with um, pot marigold, Calendula officinalis. Calendula or pot marigolds are part of the daisy family and they're not related to the marigolds that we know very well uh, of the, the genus Tegetes. Pot marigolds are considered an uh, edible flower, but they have predominantly bitter flavor. It's their brilliant orange color that livens up a plate. In the garden, calendula is a mixed blessing. It repels some pests, such as asparagus beetles and tomato hornworms, but it also attracts a few others, including aphids. So don't let that deter you. You can use the flower as a trap cop, putting it on the other side of the vegetable garden, away from the plants that aphids often attack, such as peas. Cosmos are the perfect flower to grow to attract pollinators, such as beneficial bees, wasps, and butterflies to the vegetable garden. These blooms can attract many helpful insects. For instance, if you wanna draw in green lace wings, choose a white or bright orange variety, such as cosmic orange. Green lace wings are voracious eaters, vacuum, vacuuming up all sorts of soft-bodied insects, including aphids, scale, and thrips. They're considered a beneficial insect and making them at home in your vegetable garden will help to prevent pest problems. Marigolds attract a massive array of beneficial insects to the garden, insects like parasitic wasps that control cabbage and tomato worms, uh, tomato hornworms. Um, marigolds have also been credited with repelling squash bugs, thrips, tomato hornworms and white flies and ladybugs too, which devour aphids and mealybugs in record numbers. Some marigolds even exude a chemical that kill root nematodes in the soil. However, if nematodes are a problem, you'll need to leave the marigold roots in the soil at the end of the season. Marigolds with their bright blooming uh, blooms are attractive to bees. And when it comes to pollinating crops, every garden can use more bees. So lavender is something that I use in my garden. The fragrance, the blooms, and flowers of lavender have some amazing qualities when grown near vegetables. 
and to avoid it. And ticks or mice are not fond of it either. It's also quite offensive to green cabbage moths, which can devastate gardens seemingly overnight. Lavender is also great for repelling tobacco and tomato hornworms when planted near tomato and pepper plants. So thanks for the question. Yeah, I love lavender and, and a lot of herbs that uh, you could use in your kitchen and then allow to flower do uh, attract uh, bees and native pollinators that could um, help your squash blossoms blossom as well as um, help your vegetable garden thrive. So the next question we have is regarding a very popular fruit in our gardens about tomatoes. Um, and it's asking about rats. Something is eating my tomatoes, even the green ones. What to do, what to do, netting, deterrence, help. So the brief answer is that many animals will graze on tomatoes. Not only do gardeners love tomatoes, so do the animals in the garden. Um, hornworms, tomato hornworms, can eat tomato fruits themselves, but um, they would have already consumed enough um, leaves by then to be quite noticeable. And there is a parasitic um, wasp that will actually lay its eggs on the tomato hornworm and consume it. So that is a parasitic wasp that could be attracted by what the flowers that Melissa was talking about um, that you could intersp intersperse with throughout your garden. But other wildlife do like um, tomato fruits though, especially when they are thirsty. Um, if your plant or container is at the ground level, so groundhogs, squirrels, or even rabbits could be the culprit. And if it's on a, if your tomato's on a deck or a balcony, squirrels or possibly even birds um, could be at fault. And um, even the to, um, brown marmorated stink bug may not fully eat the tomato, but they have known to be, have damage with white spots or even little divots within the fruit. And so um, while they haven't um, been as prevalent in recent years, they are still among us, um, the brown marmorated stink bug. So in order to deter all these pests, if feasible, you might have to use a physical barrier um, to protect the rest of the crop. So netting fencing is more useful than repellents um, since the latter shouldn't be sprayed directly on the fruit. Um, and as the fruits ripen, if this damage only appears on riper fruit, you can pick the tomatoes as soon as they start coloring up. Um, so, um, and then of course in the fall, you know, fried green tomatoes are, are mm -hmm. delectable. Um, so uh, you, you can let them ripen in, inside instead. And that will, um, of course, you'll have more control over deterring the uh, pest from getting to those ripening fruits. Um, so that is uh, the answer to that question, but we'll good luck with uh, determining what pest is eating those tomatoes. And um, we do have um, more um information on uh, the University of Maryland website about groundhogs. And just a reminder that you can pick your tomatoes before they fully ripen. And our next question is, has to do with um, Christmas ferns. So the question is, my Christmas fern appears to have some minimal foliage at the ends of each limb. Also light brown coloring on the back side of the end of each limb. I do not see this on the healthy full limbs. And something is also eating the violet leaves right beside it. Can you tell me what the issue is? So that question, um, Josh is gonna tackle. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so looking at the pictures, um, your, I mean, really the, your Christmas fern actually looks very, very healthy. What you're seeing are actually the, the, the fertile fronds. So at the very end, you'll see it. It looks um, relatively thin, smaller sort of uh, leaflets. Um, and then when you flip it over, what you should see are the sort of fruiting bodies or the spores. Um, so there's nothing wrong with your fern. Um, that's quite typical. Um, there was mention of some sort of brown along the, the um, uh, stipe and blade. Um, that's actually considered 
scales um, or hairs. It is uh, just part of the plant. It's actually more prominent um, before the fiddle heads um, actually um, expand and get bigger. So there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, again, the pictures look healthy. Or the, um, and so as for the violets, um, it could be rabbits. Um, I know firsthand experience rabbits will decimate just about anything, especially violets. Um, but I would not say that they are uh, connected. Um, so again, your fern is healthy and the violets are probably just food for, for animals, for wildlife. Great. Thank you, Josh. And our next question was submitted by Margaret um, and uh, it goes back to tomatoes and her tomato lower leaves are getting yellow and then brown just since the last downpour. So she was wondering, is it a virus? Is it wilt? Uh, a lack of nitrogen, what to do. And uh, she's removed all the lower leaves and bagged them up and mulched around the plants with straw to prevent splashing. So per the details of the question, it sounds like this might be a new problem after a downpour. There are two fungal diseases that can be favored by rainfall and heavy dew. Uh, septoria leaf spot and early blight and both of these funguses can overwinter in the soil and in plant debris so this is an important maintenance to do in the fall is removing any plant debris um, from the vegetable garden that could overwinter these fungal spores um, so you did the right thing removing infected leaves and bagging them is an effective method to prevent them from infecting other plants and remember that watering, when you do water on your own, besides um, the weather and the downpours that we have, should be done at the base of the plant so as to avoid wetting the foliage. Um, and then mulching around the plants will prevent the soil from splashing up on the leaves and then introducing um, the fungus from the soil into the foliage. Um, the issue does not appear to be a wilt. Um, and as regards to the question of nitrogen, a soil test, again, should be done every three years to assess the nutrients in the soil. Um, and that will give you an indication of whether or not um, any additives would need to be there in order to make sure that there's sufficient nitrogen for the growth. Um, always adding organic matter um, at any time, uh, time of the planting, and then additionally, when the growth starts, can um, continually add nutrients to your plant. Um, so at compost, um, Montgomery County's leaf grow um, that's um, recycled here, um, if you continually add that to your garden, that can help um, stave off some of those fungal um, diseases. Make sure that you're providing adequate space um, for air circulation and uh, removing the suckers from the plant base. So we do have um, a website for um, the Home and Garden Information Center that has um, tons of resources on growing tomatoes and maintaining tomatoes and tomato problems. The popular topic this time of year. And um, so those links, I believe Bev is providing those links as we're speaking. And um, we're gonna move on to potatoes. Yes, I interrupt you. Um, I just wanted to say that tomatoes are heavy nitrogen eaters. They love lots of nitrogen. So that could be um, something that you could take care of. And as well, next year, plant your tomatoes in a different location. Um, that's mm -hmm. something that we do at our farm and it's worked well. We just change them up and several of the vegetables we change up to another part of the garden, but particularly the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Or you could prepare the bed with some nitrogen fixers that would um, up the um, uptake of nitrogen, such as cover, using cover crops um, in the winter. And I know that um, comfrey is a, uh, nitrogen fixer as well with the soil. However, you have to be wary of um, the, that spreading. Comfrey likes to uh, continually uh, output, but uh, that's one herb that will fix the nitrogen. 
Thank you for adding that, Melissa. Yes, yes. Tomatoes are ferocious nitrogen feeders. <laughs> so we're going to move on to a question about potatoes. Tomatoes, potatoes. So when to harvest potatoes? My potatoes now have blossoms. What does that mean? I understand. Um, do I need to wait until the foliage dies down to harvest? My kale seedlings have already come up that I was planning to transplant to the potato area. So how long might it be until the potatoes are ready to harvest? So the um, when to harvest really depends on the date that you planted and um, the weather conditions that we've had since planting. Uh, typically the days to maturity for potato plants um, from planting to harvest is 90 to 120 days or three to four months after planting. Um, and in our area, the recommended planting time for potatoes can stretch um, from March 15th. So I, I always think about St. Patrick's Day. It's time to plant potatoes. You could plant potatoes in our area. And then all the way up to May 15th. Thereby, the harvest could occur anywhere from June 15th to August 15th. Um, so that's quite a span there. So when do you know when it's time to harvest? Well, generally, when the plants above ground do turn um, brown, that's an indicator that the tubers are ready to be dug up. You can also do a test dig in a small area around one plant. But you want to be careful because if you bruise any of the uh, fruit, it could invite, um, you know, some diseases um, that is also soil borne. Um, so, but you can test it and dig them up to see if it's the size you want to be harvested. And of course, it depends on the type of potato that you've planted. If you are um, wanting to harvest small new potatoes um, for their um, smaller size, you would want to do that earlier rather than later. Um, or let them um, go if you have baking or russet potatoes that you want to get to a nice full size, you would want to harvest them later. So it depends on the planting time. It depends on um, how you want to use the potatoes in your consumption of them. Uh, what do the blossoms mean? Well, it just means that plant is going through its natural life cycle. All plants have that seed sprout um, stage. They go through uh, the teenager stage, I like to call it, where it's a little seedling, you know, not quite a baby, not quite an adult. Then it goes to a leafing flower planting stage and then the flowering stage. And then it produces the seed um, to begin the life cycle all, all over again. It's natural, but um, potatoes are one particular crop that does not need um, pollination. So um, those below ground root vegetables, such as potatoes and sweet potatoes, um, pollinators are not required to um, produce a crop. Um, congratulations on the kale seedlings. Um, the potatoes can be left in the ground um, for a winter harvest protected by straw. Um, but if you'd like to go ahead and harvest the potatoes and then transplant the kale, um, you know, check the, do a test dig and uh, kale seeds can be strewn for a fall harvest um, right now as we speak and successfully all the way up to um, uh, next week, about August 10th is the recommended time from July 10th to August 10th to get a fall harvest of kale. So the University of Maryland has a um, page on potatoes um, as well um, and planting dates and harvest for vegetable crops in our area that they recommend. So that is the question on tomatoes, potatoes. And we're gonna go to Baptisia. What is wrong with the Baptisia I planted this year? The stems and seed pods are turning black. Should I remove it? Um, so Josh is gonna tackle this question. Thank you, Heather. Um, yeah, so based on the pictures, it looks to be a root issue. Um, it looks like maybe there's, you know, I'm not sure if that's a raised planter um, but one of the things I would do is, is, is dig out some of your soil or substrate um, and just take a look at that. The soil structure may be pretty heavy, so it may be causing some root rot. Um, we've had, well, we did just have a lot of rain, at least uh, in, in my area. Um, but I've noticed from personal experience that typically Baptiste like to be on the drier side. Um, and it looks like there is a grower tag in with the 
with it. So what I would do is I would, you know, whenever you go and buy perennials, if you can, um, if they allow it at the, at the nursery, um, always flip the, the pot over. If you can gently pull the root ball out and look at the roots to make sure that they're a nice white kind of fleshy um, color. If they're dark brown and squishy, typically you want to avoid that plant. Um, with that being said, you know, there are two, um, type of types of rot that can get into these, but typically at, at the cultivation or at the propagation time, that would be rise, rise stem rot, um, and also syndrocladium stem rot. Um, and really to prevent that, what you need is you need sort of a sterile medium or, or, or one that doesn't have any kind of pathogen in it. Um, and also keep in mind, anytime you do any sort of pruning, um, try to make a habit of cleaning your pruning tools off. Um, not just using, say, rubbing alcohol. That's great for removing sap and other plant sort of saps. But, you know, use something like a, like a diluted bleach um, mixture and then go ahead and, and wipe that down with some sort of um, anti-rust uh, oil um, like WD-40, for example. Um, so again, to me, it looks like there's, there's a root issue going on, um, with, with the portions that are already black, um, they're not going to come back. So go ahead and cut those out. Um, and hopefully it'll, it'll push out of it. Great, great reminder to, um, clean and disinfect the tools that you're using. And if you do have an issue so that you're not complicating the issue and spreading it around your garden, it's a great way to, to uh, uh, reduce, alleviate any, any uh, future headaches. True, true. <laughs> in the so garden. Pre- preventive maintenance there. Exactly. Both for your tools and for the garden. Exactly. So our next question is um, about cryptomeria, which was planted um, about nine years ago. It has always been about 50% alive. So half red and half green. What is causing the red dye back? And the um, respondent said that the tree is in a shady location. So Melissa is going to respond to this question. Sure. Lisa, thank you so much for the question. And this is one of my favorite trees, and we've got lots of them in my neighborhood. So I'm so glad you sent it in. Um, Fomopsis is a twig blight of juniper, also known as nursery blight, cedar, juniper, or needle blights, is caused by the fungus Fomopsis juniperova. Um, Economic damage to the landscape plantings and nursery stock is largely restricted to species and cultivars of juniper. Uh, The disease is mainly a leaf and shoot infection found in young plants and on the new growth of older plants. Where practical, you can prune out and burn all blighted parts as they appear. Restrict pruning or uh, or anything of that nature to periods of dry weather because infection can be further reduced by restricting pruning to periods when the resulting new growth sim- stimulated by pruning occurs in the drier part of the season, which is from late June through early August. But actually, July was pretty moist, so now would be a good time to do that. Uh, Every seven to 10 days in dry weather, remove and burn all infected seedlings or place them in sealed plastic bags and haul them off to a sanitary landfill. Fungicides give effective control when applied at the right time. Since only new growth is is susceptible to this uh, fungus, spray at bud break and then repeat at 10 to 14 day intervals until the new growth has matured when needles have changed from light green to light yellow green to dark green. Spray also when new flushes of growth appear in the summer and early fall or in response to pruning or shearing. If extended periods of wet weather persist, spray every 10 to 14 days as long as young susceptible needles are present. Because the fungus can only invade and attack young, tender, unwounded needles of healthy, vigorous plants, keep new growth thoroughly protected by regularly spraying, and it's really important. During prolonged wet warm periods in the spring and summer, April through early June, and again in late August and September, the fungus becomes particularly infectious. Let's see. Um, Germinated spores of Fomopsis are not killed by drying like many other funguses. 
uh, fungi, but begin growing again when the conditions return. Within three to five days after infection, the fungus per permeates the young needles and quickly invades young stem tissue. After colonizing a side shoot, the fungus mycelium progresses into the main stem, growing rapidly along the inner bark, killing the cambium and staining the wood a brownish color. Within three to four weeks after infection, um, pycrinidia develop on the needles and stems that have died and turned like an ash gray. At first, they're embedded in the tissue, but later after the infected tissue has dried considerably, they partially erupt through the epidermis. During wet warm weather, spores ooze from, the, from these um, pycinidia and are easily and quickly dispersed. That's how it, it moves around. The fungus can persist as, in, as mycelium in dead parts of the infected plants for as long as two years. So thank you for that question. I, I learned a lot on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and our last question is going to wrap it up with um, a nice big bow and a Japanese maple question. What's going on with that? Uh, the large one, which is about 15 to 20 years old, is the parent to the smaller ones. And I just noted the, noticed the large trees dying branches this summer. There has been no change in the mulch or the water or the plants beneath it, and the whole branches gradually die, and then another branch starts to decline. So the young Japanese maple trees are coloring up like it is fall. So um, either Melissa or Josh want to tackle the Japanese maple question. Well, sure. we could both do it. Yeah, go, go <laughs> Josh, ahead, Melissa. I say that um, there's a neighborhood near my home that this is happening in to all their maple trees and they're all having to be taken out and plant you know new plants new trees come in and these trees are like 50 60 years old um, may, many maple trees in the area are dying these slow deaths a few branches go leafless and die here and there and then there's nothing left after a few years in fact several of the trees have no leaves there's no single blatant explanation for why so many of these beautiful specimens are biting the dust Worse, there's no quick and easy fix to make it stop. Josh, what do you think it's called? Well, so I, from my personal experience, I've seen, you know, within the past couple of years, we've had torrential downpours, torrential rains. Um, and I've actually lost some maples here, at, actually, at Brookside. Um, so I think a lot of it, what comes down to is, is too much water, um, which then can cause problems such as verticillium oil. Um, you know, maple and Japanese maples for the most part are pretty resilient. Um, they can tolerate pretty wide range of soils, but they don't like poorly drained really, really wet. So, you know, again, with, with those heavy rains, I think it's just kind of overloading their root system. Um, so I think that's a big cause. Um, you know, another thing you have to look out for um, is like in this one picture here, I see, it looks like it's kind of hard to tell, but it looks like there may be some damage to the cambium, to the bark. Um, so that can actually set a tree back, especially one that's this size, which like looks as though it's younger. Um, also another thing to consider is that turf can actually be, um, detrimental to the, the formation of roots, um, especially for newly planted trees. Um, so you can have some competition between the turf, um, and the tree roots. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind, but I have a feeling that, you know, based on these pictures, it, it more than likely has to do with, uh, the amount of moisture in the soil, um, leading to things such as say verticillium will, um, it's unfortunate, um, but it happens, especially with all this rain we've been having. And the smaller tree could be protected if by mo from mowers, a lot of times mowers will damage uh, tree bark. So you can mulch around the tree and um, fencing to protect um, from the deer as well. Yeah, I think that's one of the thing. you know, one of the things about, you know, tree circles, it's not, you know, some people just consider it just an aesthetic thing, but it's actually really a functional um, uh, uh, like imp implementation as well. Again, you keep the mowers away, the weed eaters. Um, not just that, but there's no competition between, say, turf and, and the tree roots. Now, eventually, when they get bigger, I mean, the, you know, typically the, the tree itself will put out 
roots further than say the drip line but that's again we want to give the tree especially the young one that's in the picture um, a fighting chance help it along as much as we can uh, without further you know uh, uh, adding to its transplant shock right great thank you melissa and thank you josh for both of your expert responses on the japanese maple and uh, Melissa, um, I know you have uh, a little plug to put in there. If you want to learn more about um, your landscape and being more knowledgeable about um, the management and, pest management and, and yes, increasing your diagnostic knowledge, um, try some of the classes at Montgomery College. I think there's a link up on the screen uh, you can click on and get more information. But um, after becoming a master gardener, I started taking those classes and it was incredible for me. I know so many different plants now in my area. I grew up in the desert. I moved here shortly um, or just a, a little bit ago. So it was hard for me to dif differentiate between all the evergreens in the winter time. And now I can. In addition, I'm able to to and be able to help them as well. So um, I think it's a great thing to do to understand the area and also to increase your knowledge of um, diagnostics and what pets pests are invading your yard. And that's on the screen. And uh, I hope that you will you will go on there because it's it's changed my life. Great, great. So, and if you have any questions um, for our experts, you can go to the link for the In the Garden program. Um, again, please enter as much detail as possible. The details can help us zero in on um, uh, your question. Photos are very welcomed and very important, also um, giving us the ability to kind of determine what's going on. So the cutoff for the inclusion in the next session of In the Garden is next Wednesday, August 11th at 6 p.m. And then they will be answered on the next In the Garden program, which is Tuesday, August 17th at noon. We're going to make every effort to answer your questions on air and live. But if we run out of time on our show, we will provide an answer to you via email. So, um Bev, I guess, is posting the link for your questions if you want to submit. So I thank you, Melissa and Josh, for being our experts today and giving us that uh, tour of Japanese gardens at Brookside. Hope you can go visit there and be mindful. And our researchers for this week, we do have a lot of people working behind the scenes uh, in order to provide the accurate information to you. That was Mary Lou. Barbara and Mary, and of course, Bev, our producer today, who's got mission control over there with three computers and uh, making sure that we are um, being heard and seen on Facebook today. So thank you all for joining us. And again, our next program is August 17th. Remember, if you would like any questions answered, please contact us on the link on the screen um by next wednesday at 6 p.m so thank you for joining us and enjoy that time in your garden in august thanks